Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. You're all very welcome to our webinar this morning. We'll just kick off in about 30 seconds. Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, you're all welcome to our webinar this morning. Uh, my name is Sean Fine. I'm the CEO of the Irish Bioenergy Association, and um, I'm delighted to welcome you to webinar number 29, which is on the topic of energy supply contracts deliver delivering decarbonized biomass heating without the capex. Um, so we're looking forward to presenting to you this morning on this topic. Um, I apologize to our regular attendees, uh, but we have some new participants this morning. So just a brief introduction to the Irish Bioenergy Association. Um, so we were established in 1999. We're the representative body for the bioenergy sector on the island of Ireland. And we work across the main sectors of biomass, biogas, biofuels, biochar, wood fuels, and energy crops. Our main work is in the area of policy lobbying and advocacy. And we have a broad and diverse range of members. Um, from farmers to foresters to small and medium enterprises, technology providers, various consultants, semi-state organizations, fuel suppliers, mm -hmm. and financial institutions, and anyone really with an interest in the bioenergy sector. We're also engaged in a number of research and development projects. We roll out the Wood Fuel Quality Assurance Scheme and are currently working on our European Innovation Partnership Small Biogas Demonstration Project, our 3C project, which is in the BioShare area, and also the just, our Just Transition Fund Midlands Bioenergy Development Programme. So to find out more about our organisation, please visit www.erbia.org. Uh, we have done, this is our 29th webinar in our series, so we've covered a wide, diverse range of topics uh, to date. And if there is anyone on uh, any of our attendees that would like to um, present uh, on a topic of interest, please feel free to get in touch with uh, myself or my colleague, Teresa O'Brien. We'd be happy to discuss further with you uh, how you could potentially present and what topic you could present on. Um, webinar 29 is um, this morning's webinar, and we're delighted to be joined by Jared Cross, Commercial Director at Woodco Renewable Energy, who will present to us this morning, and also be joined by my colleague, Noel Gavigan, who will um, provide some uh, insights and feedback on some of the uh, discussion points and also the questions which you, you may have. If you have any questions, feel free to submit them through the Q&A tab at the bottom of our screen, uh, and we will endeavor to answer as many questions as possible. Uh, just a brief reminder to save the date for our next webinar, webinar number 30. Um, our next speaker will be Mr. Kieran Coffey from MyGoG, and it will be on the topic of microscale anaerobic digestion. So I look forward to welcoming you back in two weeks time, this day two weeks, uh, for our next webinar. Full details and registration link will be published through our social media channels in the coming days. So this morning's uh, speaker is Jared Cross. Jared is Commercial Director at Woodco Renewable Energy and Woodco is an Irish manufacturer of biomass boiler systems and has been deploying renewable heat under ESCO uh, energy supply contracts to clients in the healthcare, leisure and hospitality sectors. There are many models of ESCO contracts which exist uh, and Woodco this morning will talk about that and talk about their offering in this area. Uh, Woodco offers businesses the opportunity to decarbonize and lower their heating bills without any capital expenditure. And this is a model where my heat users can pay for their heat um, over a contracted period of time and it guarantees, it is guaranteed to provide energy savings annually compared to a uh, displaced fossil fuel alternative. So we look forward to, uh, to hearing from Jer. Uh, and as he presents this morning on this topic. So if we could ask Jer um, to uh, turn on your camera and I will share your slides here, um, Jer. So if you just give me one second and... Um, and share your screen. So share and share. So, Jared, can you see your scre the screen there? And, I can, uh, yeah. Thanks, yes. Sean. Uh, so, over to you, Jared. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Sean. Good morning, everyone. Yeah. So, um, Jared Cross is my own name, and um, I'm part of a family business in Tipperary. We've been manufacturing biomass boilers for a long time. So, um, 
a little bit of the background, I suppose, we've been manufacturing, we, we ran the journey, I suppose, 50 years ago, we would have manufactured solid fuel boilers, coal turf boilers, and then oil boilers in the 80s and 90s. And in, in the last decade or more, uh, Declan, my brother and I, we've uh, concentrated solely on biomass heating. And that's all we do now in the business is biomass heating. So, uh, you know, over a number of years, we've become kind of specialists in that area. And then um, we would have, you know, had a good had a good run in the UK. There was a similar scheme called the Renewable Heat Incentive in Britain, uh, the, R the RHI. So we saw how that model worked there. And thankfully, there's a similar model now in Ireland uh, for, for called the Support Scheme for Renewable Heat, which I'll explain a little bit in a minute. So <clears throat> just a context then, uh, and, and Teresa's going to move on the slides for me. So Ireland, like, um, we're in dire need to decarbonise our heating. And I think this table says a lot. We're... Of the 27 EU countries were last, and only 6.3% of our energy comes from renew of our heating comes from renewable energy. And there's a huge task on the hands of the, of the government and everybody in the industry to um to get us up to 40% by 2030. That's that's the challenge that's there. So with that, there was, uh, the SSRH scheme was uh, introduced in 2019 to try and get us from that lowly 6% up to 40% by 2030. And um, bioenergy, the top countries on that graph that you see there, the top, you could say five countries on that graph have all put bioenergy center stage in, in the terms of decarbonizing their heating. So it's no coincidence they're at the top. And um, we need to get that message across in Ireland that uh, bioenergy needs to become center stage. Uh, it's, a, it's a very effective uh, um, medium for decarbonizing heating and getting displacing fossil fuel. So that's what uh, a lot of what we're talking about today is about and what we're about. So if we go on to the next slide, as I said, in 2019, uh, the support scheme for renewable heat was introduced uh, in Ireland um, a couple of years later than we all would have liked, but it's there now and it's working. And so I have a short little video there that um, Sean might play. Just It's a one minute video just explaining how the SSRH scheme works. So, Jerry, I get it up now. If you just give me one second, sorry. And yep. so okay, Sean. And share. And share sound. <clears throat> The impacts of climate change are being felt globally. Ireland still relies heavily on fossil fuels. About 70% of our energy is generated using oil, coal, peat and other non-renewable sources, which has a serious effect on the environment. Together, we need to take action to tackle climate change. In 2019, the government will be launching the Support Scheme for Renewable Heat, or SSRH, for biomass heating a financial incentive to encourage businesses to switch from fossil fuels to more sustainable heating. Business owners will be paid a tariff every year for 15 years based on renewable heat generated, allowing you to make huge savings on heating bills for your farm or business. Woodco is a leading manufacturer of efficient and reliable biomass boiler systems. Our team of expert engineers will design a bespoke system to meet your requirements for any project. For more information, call us on 062 74 007 or visit www.woodco energy.com. Okay, Chair, we go back to the slides yep. now, one second. Um, now, can you see that, Chair? Yeah, thanks, Sean. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so the key message in that is basically there's a 15 year incentive. Um, uh, emanating from the SEAI um, to, to cover, um, to, to reward people for uh, decarbonizing their heating, moving off fossil fuel. You've got to be moving off fossil fuel to qualify for that scheme. And uh, you can see there on that table, um, the first 300 megawatt hours of heat that one uh, uses, um, they'll earn 5.6 cents for every kilowatt. So that's, a, that's an incentive that's quite generous. Uh, it needs to be that because there's significant capital costs involved but um, it's the one that has now mobilized uh, the bioenergy and the bioheating sector in Ireland. 
So, um, and that's why we can do what we can do. So if I go on to the next slide then, Sean. Uh, Sorry, Joe, yeah. Yeah, so, so basically, what is an energy supply contract? <clears throat> so um, there's, there's, two, there's two scenarios open to somebody that wants to, end, that wants to avail of bioenergy or bioheat and renewable heat. They can actually buy the boiler themselves and install it and own it and operate it, or else they can enter into a, a, an energy supply contract. And it's where the supplier, in our case, where the biomass boiler manufacturer, will supply the system free of charge to the client and we'll operate and maintain it. So simply for a business, they'll just pay, there's a heat meter on the boiler that measures the amount of kilowatt hours produced and they'll, they, the client will simply pay for the heat it, it, um, it uses, just like any utility company. And it's pretty attractive. It's attractive to businesses that have high heating costs. So any business that has processed heat or using heat quite a lot over a sustained period of time, uh, an energy supply contract might be the right solution for them. And also we're only interested in providing energy supply contracts to businesses that are using lots of heat. So, you know, today uh, in this early stage even uh, of the SSRH scheme in play, we've several uh, businesses on energy supply contracts and particularly care homes and leisure facilities. They seem to be the sector that are initially seem to be uh, availing of this. So um, we have a number and I'll show you some, some examples of, of those sites and projects. Um, so next slide, please. Yeah, so, so, so I suppose some of it is why, why ESCOs and why did we get involved in it? Well, as I said at the outset, um, we had pretty, we had a kind of a bird's eye view of how it worked in Britain when the RHI scheme, which was a very effective scheme for the last 10 years there, which was running. And, and um, we supplied many boilers to um, energy supply contracts in Britain. Um, so um, particularly poultry farmers, we supplied on one occasion, we supplied 60 boilers to a large poultry group in Britain, where the boilers were funded by, and this is interesting, by a city of London kind of finance firm. Uh, there was lots of money in that space uh, dived into supplying energy supply contracts because at the end of the day, it's guaranteed secure investment. Um, in Britain, it was a 20 year incentive that the, um, the, owner, the owner of the boiler uh, obtained. So basically they put in a, put in a, a ex, um, capital expenditure, put in a boiler on a, on a farm, and they could get an income from it for 20 years and it's, it's sovereign backed, I guess. Um, so, um, you know, we've, we've, we've over four and a half thousand boilers supplied worldwide, many of them in Britain and many of them on energy supply contracts. So I always said to myself, whenever uh, such a scheme or when the policies are right and the environment is right in Ireland, that we would offer energy supply contracts in Ireland because we have the skill set here, we have the, we manufacture the boilers, we do all the, the application process with the SEI and, and engage with them. And then we have the, the resources on the ground in terms of service engineers, maintenance men, and relationships with fuel suppliers here that um, is quite strong. So we felt um, we were in a good position to be able to offer energy supply contracts in Ireland. So, you know, again, why have I embarked on, on these ESCOs? Well, for many clients, you know, uh, no matter what way you slice or dice it, um, putting in a biomass boiler is more expensive than a fossil fuel boiler. And for many, CapEx is a barrier. Um, very often you're looking at a six figure sum. And um, so, you know, with the funding in place to do this. So, like, but many clients, it's particularly in, in the present uh, climate, they want to save money and they want to eliminate fossil fuel and carbon intensive heating. So people's motivation are, are, are two of those things. So, but they may, have, they may have a bit of an issue with the whole capital expenditure. And um, so we, we decided we wanted to play our part in offering ESCOs, energy supply contracts, putting boilers into, into businesses that may not ordinarily go ahead with it. And we want to play our part by um, achieving 40% renewable heat by 2030. <clears throat> So it's a win-win for the client and for the ESCO provider. The client is going to save money, the client is going to decarbonize, and we're, we, it's a good business model for, for, for ourselves. So how does the ESCO do it? And, and, um, or how does the energy supply contractor do it? Well, I suppose, as I said at the outset, the, it's a game, the game changer was a support scheme for renewable heat. Uh, the ESCO owns the boiler, so the ESCO uh, gets the income from the support scheme for renewable heat. And, and, and on the graph there, you see the, the um, this is something um, borrowed from SEAI. Um, the support scheme for renewable heat was to open around 2019. And 
if, if we did nothing, Ireland was due to uh, was due to get on a tra trajectory to to um, increase its um, its um, our, its amount of renewable heat up to about um, eight percent. But with the incentive from 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 SSR from SEAI, um, our renewable heat was due to increase to twelve percent by 2020, 2021. Uh, sadly, it, that hasn't happened. So, um, for a few a few administrative reasons, I suppose more than anything else, but certainly uh, the momentum should be should be increasing um, to, to try and do it. So, so the ESCO provider is um, is going to get the incentive, the SSRH incentive, because it owns the boiler. Each quarter, then the ESCO provider or the boiler provider will uh, submit its meter reading to SEAI and will get paid. Uh, the SSRH income from the SCAI. And each quarter as well, the, 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 the client who's using the heat will pay for the heat it's used. So the SSRH, in, in effect, the income we receive in the SSRH is used to fund the CapEx and to fund the ongoing maintenance of the boiler. That's how the ESCO does it. And just to continue on that line, um, you know, people can say, might say, well, how does the ESCO do it? You know, what happens if the price of oil uh, decreases or the price of gas decreases? And um, like our guarantee for the clients who enter an ESCO agreement with us is that we will guarantee them to save them money every year for the 15 years of the, of the, of the contract. So, you know, and, and you might say there's a little element of risk in that. But if you look at the graph, this, is the, this, this graph here um, shows the average price of oil which is the, the middle line, the second line from the top for the last 13 years. The top line actually is the price of electricity for the last 13 years. And you can see wood pellets, which is the green line underneath. It has always been, for the last 13 years, has always been cheaper than, than oil and LPG and electricity. So, and even wood chip is even cheaper than wood pellets. So that's in itself, that's kind of um, historically, um, one, it makes an, an, an ESCO very doable. Um, the second reason that it's significant that the, for the ESCO that it's significantly de-risked is uh, biomass fuel is exempt from carbon tax. And on the converse side, um, fossil fuel like LPG gas oil is subject to carbon tax. And that carbon tax is increasing incrementally each year from now out to 2030. And people often ask me, what does seven euro 50 a tonne that goes on our carbon tax every, every June, how much, what does that mean or how, what does it equate to? Well, in, in, in terms of oil, it adds 1.6 cents to every liter of oil um, each year. So another 1.6 cents is going, going to go on to the price of oil next June. Another 1.6 cents on top of that again, the June after. So between now and 2030, the price of oil will increase by about 13 or 14 cents if nothing else changes, purely, purely on carbon tax. So again, uh, the biomass fuel is not, um, is not subject to carbon tax. So again, that significantly de-risks it. And that's why we're able to say with a certain, with a fair degree of certainty, we can always offer fuel and heating cheaper than the fossil fuel alternative. And then the third thing, the third thing is, um, this is our HS state backed. It's a guarantee to pay this incentive for 15 years. So, you know, we've a, we've a, we've a, as, as the ESCO owner, as the owner of the asset, we don't start a project until we, we get a letter from the SEI saying, they're going to pay X amount of money for the next 15 years based on, on, the, on, the, uh, on, the, on the heat used at this property. And the other reason we think it's fairly de-risked is we, we control the whole process. So we, we design the system, we submit it to the SEAI, um, we uh, install the we manufacture the boiler, we install it, and then we manage it for the 15 years. So we're in total charge. So we're, I guess we're, we're I guess we're confident in our own skin that we can deliver deliver these projects. So that's how the uh, uh, ESCO does it. So what we did, what we've done as a company in Woodco, we've set up a special purpose vehicle, SPV, and just specifically to offer ESCOs. And um, a fair bit of work has gone into this. And um, we've got a contract, a, a special ESCO contract drawn up by Philip Lee, commercial law firm, one of the top law firms in Dublin. Um, an award-winning law firm, so they've they've done it, and um, so it's it's a flexible document, but it's uh, it's it's very good, and um, so we we so Woodco then as a manufacturer supplies our we supply our boilers to to the SPV, a special property called Bioenergy Installations. So the ESCO contract is with bio is between Bioenergy Installations and the client. So 
Bioenergy uh, applies to SEI to get approval for the project. That can take a number of months, and we get a letter of offer from the SEI approving us for the SSRH scheme. We go and install the boiler, the fuel store, everything. I mean, our commitment to the client is they don't have to spend a single euro on CapEx, right? And then we'll provide fuel to the boiler for 15 years, and we'll operate and maintain the boiler for 15 years. Okay, thanks, John. Yeah. So again, wh why is this attractive to a business? And you know, certain businesses um, may not like the idea of a biomass boiler um, in their on their property that they know nothing about. You know, they've been, they, they, their core business is either if it's horticulture, it's growing vegetables. If it's a care home, it's keeping the, the residents uh, safe and well. And having to own and operate a biomass boiler um, might be they might see that as a stretch too far for them. So it's attractive for a business where there's no capex involved. They have no maintenance costs, they have no operating costs, uh, and you just pay for the heat you use. And, and also, we're giving them a guarantee that we supply them the heat at 10 or 15% less than the cost of the fossil fuel equivalent. So, to, as I said at the outset, it's a win win. Um, there's savings guaranteed, and you're eliminating fossil fuel and carbon from your business, which is becoming more important. Yeah, so again, probably reiterating, re reiterating the same point. That's one of our boilers there in a plant room. Um, you see, you can see in that picture as well, there's obviously the oil boiler is kept as a backup. It, their uh, clients are allowed to keep their existing uh, fossil fuel boiler as a backup. And you see a big buffer tank there. And um, that's a typical biomass installation. And um, that's a 500 kilowatt boiler there. Um, so it's attractive to businesses that are using lots of heat. Like what we're not going to do is put in a biomass boiler into a, are entering into an ESCO agreement with a client that's that's going to have low heat or isn't going to use it. You've got to use it. And I'll come to some of that. There's some, some conditions in the contract that are important to point out. And as I said, we have several care homes and uh, who are, again, are we consider large users of heat because they use heat consistently. Even through the summertime, they need heat for bathing clients or, or bathing their residents, I should say, and, and, um, and hot water and heating anyhow. And leisure facilities are another good one. Swimming pools. Um, have the heat on all year round, huge energy bills, and we we find those particular businesses very attractive for an ESCO. So, what's the business committing to? Um, to you know, it's it's important. You know, it's uh, for the clients. They're com they're committing to using the heat from the biomass boilers priority. That's important. You saw in the last picture they're allowed to keep their oil boiler, but they've got to use the biomass as a prior as a priority. It's the first choice, but. You know, when, we, when we're in for a day, maybe servicing the boiler, of course, they're allowed to use their oil boiler in those cases or our gas boiler as a backup. Um, they're committing to a fair usage policy. So we agree at the minimum amount of heat that they must use. And it's a pretty fair. So we analyzed our bills over the last year or two or a couple of years. And we say, right, you're going to use, you're using X amount of heat, typically in a year. We will set a minimum amount of, say, maybe 10, 10 to 15% less than that. And we say, that's the fair usage policy. You must use at least that amount of heat. So people need to be fairly comfortable with their business model that they're going to use the heat each year. And then they're committing to pay, paying for the heat monthly. So based on the heat meter reading, they'll, uh, they'll um, pay for the heat. And typically the ones we've done to date have all been a 15 year contract, basically to coincide with the life of the SSRH scheme. Um, now we can, we, uh, contracts can be tailored to suit certain requirements, but typically they're the ones we like to do. And, um, as I said, they're allowed to retain and maintain their existing boiler. And another kind of condition in the contract that's there is we have to be allowed access to the property to service and operate the boiler. So un uninhibited access to the boiler. And um, again, that's in, that's in the contract. So the type of business that it suits, that the ESCO suits is, you know, basically I put pictures of the oil lorries there and the gas lorries. If they're a frequent visitor, visitor to your property, then you should be probably talking to us or certainly looking at biomass heating. Um, businesses that have a consistent high heat demand, that are using oil or gas uh, uh, steadily throughout the year. And typically the ones that lend itself well to um, an ESCO, if where you're using maybe 300,000 kilowatt hours of heat a year, that's probably the minimum amount we would, we would um, entertain. Um, and, you know, 300,000 kilowatt hours is about 30,000 litres of oil. So if somebody's using 30,000 litres of oil a year, 40,000 litres of LPG gas, um, then certainly we'd be interested in talking to them about ESCOs. And again, we're probably interested in talking to established businesses um, where there's less risk. 
Um, so, so far, the, the clients that we've done business with and are, are, are doing business with are care homes, leisure centers, hotels, and some businesses that require process heat. Okay. And um, the type of business that suits is, is a business that might want off balance sheet an off-balance sheet solution. They don't want to purchase the capital, capital item. They don't want it on their balance sheet. And um, other businesses, actually, that's a uh, business is probably the wrong word, but public sector buildings is another sector that's starting to look at all of this. And I think the ESCO solution is an ideal one for schools, uh, county council offices, leisure centres, and all of that. And basically for business, what we find is a business where they might be uh, a little unsure of the, that they have the expertise on site, where they mightn't have a caretaker or a maintenance guy or a guy to keep an eye on the boiler. Um, they just don't want that burden or that uh, responsibility and they mightn't have the expertise. So they're happy for a, a, a company like ourselves to come in and do all of that. Um, so there's a couple of types of ESCOs. I mean, um, the, es the ESCO model I've been talking about up to now has been the full ESCO, where the ESCO, ESCO provider provides the assets, bears all the associated costs and the risks, right? And um, we've kind of phrased ourselves in another type of model that's called the hybrid ESCO. And that can be, we can be tailored to suit whatever circumstances one wants. On a couple of occasions, we've done an ESCO where the user owns the asset, they want to own it, and they want some of the benefits of the SSRH, but they want a 15-year contract from somebody to provide um, and operate the system and, uh, and provide heat and provide fuel. They want uh, uh, the ESCO provider to provide that element of the project. So it can be tailored, although our preference is for the for the full ESCO. Um, but there, you know, a hybrid ESCO is certainly something we can talk to. And again, some public buildings uh, that I know the Department of Education at the moment are looking at some, some hybrid ESCO models. And uh, we're hoping to do one or two from now in the very near future. Okay. So again, you know, why would anyone do it? It's all about the fuel savings. So at the moment, if we were to enter, enter into an agreement with a client, um, we would be selling heat to them at about 7.6 cents a kilowatt hour. So our commitment is we'll sell heat at between 10 and 15% less than the price of oil at the moment. So if oil is 78 cents a liter, that's about the equivalent of 9 cents a kilowatt hour. Or if gas is 60 cents a liter, it's the equivalent of 9.8 cents a kilowatt hour. So we, so we come along and we'll supply it we guarantee to the client we'll supply them heat at 10 or 15 percent less than that and how do we do that um well each year in part of the S one of the conditions in the esco agreement is we sit down on the anniversary of the agreement each year and we get the price from three local oil or gas suppliers uh we get the average we get the price of a liter of oil or gas or a, or a kilowatt of, of natural gas and we, we we get the average of the three of them and that's our spot rate and then we guarantee we supply heat at less than that amount. So you know, once we once we fix the price, that's it for the that's it for the next twelve months, and we we'll supply um, heat at a guaranteed price uh, for the next twelve months, and then we revisit it again and, and and set the spot rate for the next for the next twelve months. Okay, next slide. So again, so just some examples um, of installations we've done under ESCO agreements. And there you see a care home in Tipperary, uh, just installed there uh, two, two months ago. And um, it's a 150 kilowatt boiler. Again, we like the idea of an eco cabin. Um, we enter into this agreement all in good faith. Everyone does. We sign a contract and it will last for 15 years. But, you know, if something happens or there's a default or something, at least we can pick up our assets and take it away. So an eco cabin is... For that reason, again, it's another reason we're able to de-risk it. And a lot of the boilers that we do and are uh, that uh, um, the SRH, under the SRH scheme fit in a, in a nice containerized solution. And it's our plug and play solution. So that, that job there, he was displacing LPG gas in a 60 bed care home in Tipperary. Again, another care home there in County, County Mayo. Again, uh, Black Rocks care home in uh, Foxford, County Mayo. Again, you see the eco cabin and the fuel store just set at the back of the back of the property. Um, they're displacing forty thousand liters of kerosene uh, a year and um, eliminating a hundred tons of carbon per, an per annum. So again, you know, they're delighted. They're saving money um, with no capex, and they're using the heat all year round. That one was installed last summer, and uh, it's been running successfully for them. Uh, again, similar scenario, uh, a care home in County Galway, 
150 kilowatt boiler and a care home. Again, these were displacing LPG gas. Typically, care homes and these properties, they're in the countryside. They're off the gas, off the natural gas network. Um, so they're using expensive oil and LPG gas, and they're looking for a solution. And, um, you know, would be hurting at the moment with, uh, with the energy costs. And we come along and provide them that. So, um, again, there's a cabin in a, a guest house in County Mayo. Again, um, it's a busy guest house on the River Moy. Um, lots of tourists coming there, lots of showers, lots of heat all year round. Even in the summertime, they're using heat. So we were able to do an ESCO agreement with them to put in a 100 kilowatt eco cabin. Just on that picture there, you see the fuel store is integrated into the cabin and the, the filling pipes. So the truck comes along and can blow the fuel up in from up to 30 meters away. So it connects up to it and blows the pellet, wood pellets into the, into the boiler. And um, it's a nice... Uh, plug and play solution again. And again, this is one we expect to be doing in, in, uh, in the next two, three months. We're just uh, waiting on um, the SSRH approval from the SEAI, which is for, it's for Kilkenny County Council. Again, a leisure centre using one and a half million kilowatt hours of gas per annum. And we're putting a 500 kilowatt boiler in there um, to displace the gas. And it's, uh, again, it's be a fairly attractive um, Proposition again, county councils and that are, um, you know, it's, they're they're behoven to uh, to um, decarbonize and reduce energy costs. And anyway, gas has gone very expensive. You know, they've gone from probably, well, I, I can't say for this example, but I know a lot of uh, people using natural gas are getting a huge jump. It's gone from maybe two cents a kilowatt hour up to maybe nine, ten, eleven cents a kilowatt hour. So it's a huge increase in gas costs in the last number of months, given what's going on in the world and. Um, uh, being crippled with energy costs. So biomass is a great solution here. So again, just to kind of nearly summarize and, and conclude, but like why the ESCO is a compelling case for a business, there's probably five bullet points there. You know, they can slash their heating costs by 10 or 15%. They're future-proofing, you know? It's, it's not about now, it's about the next 15 years that we, if we can save 10 or 15% and over the next 10 or 15 years, uh, 15 years, there's a lot, it's a lot of money. There's no CapEx involved. So we'll supply the equipment free of charge. You're avoiding carbon tax. So wood pellets are exempt from carbon tax. And, you know, people have, people have an incentive to decarbonize now, particularly public buildings like schools and that, you know, they, they have to take the lead and decarbonize and put in uh, renewable energy. And then there's certainty. A lot of people um, like the idea that I don't have to, if my, if my oil boiler leaks or my gas boiler breaks down, I don't get a shock of maybe spend three or 4,000 or buying a new one. There's certainty here. You don't, you're not, you're not going to have to pay for any, ongoing maintenance costs. It's built into the price of the fuel, of the heating. Yeah, so that concludes my presentation on energy supply contracts. There's my contact details if, you, if anybody wants to reach out to us. So um, we go back to Sean now. It's a Q&A session. That's great, Chair. Thanks very much for your presentation. Very informative and um, for giving us an outline of um, the various projects and works that you're uh, engaged in. So thank you for that. Um, if I could just ask Noel, uh, Noel is joining us on the panel, maybe just to give you a chance, Chair, to catch your breath for a second there. Um, there is a couple of questions coming in, so we will take them. Um, and um, But before I bring, in, bring you back in, Chair, in terms of the couple of questions, um, could I ask Noel maybe just to maybe comment? Um, we we're happy to see the publication last week of the SEI heat study um, and uh, certainly uh, it articulates uh, a strong and significant role for bioenergy heating in the in the near future and over the next number of years as we decarbonize our heating system so perhaps Noel you maybe just give us some high level comments on the what you have read so far it's a very detailed report uh, lots of documents as part of it so can you just give us some feedback while Jared is just catching his breath there ahead of a few questions? Maybe just give some uh, feedback. <coughs> yeah, for the, the entire that. report is, uh, and it's a collection of documents, there's eight documents in total, and you know, you're probably averaging about 100 pages a piece, a piece. so it's it's a substantial piece of work uh, titled Net Zero by 2050 by SEAI. And you have obviously a, it's an overall document, and then it breaks down into seven further studies which look into various areas um, and it's, it's a very comprehensive study, in fairness. Um, there's a number of things which we, we like to see in it. Um, it covers uh, sustainable bioenergy for heat. Obviously enough, it covers uh, district heating, 
there is low carbon gases, carbon capture and storage. Um, and it, so it does go into quite a comprehensive piece of work into, into what we can do going forward. It's very strong in it. It looks into a number of different scenarios. So you've obviously a very ambitious scenario. You have a, a baseline scenario uh, looking at do we concentrate on decarbonized gas? Do we concentrate on high electrification or a balanced approach? In all of the approaches that are there, um, bioenergy is supplying anywhere between 7 and 17% of the heat. So it's a substantial, uh, it's, I suppose from SEI, it's, a, it's a, a very strong statement that bioenergy is going to be very important going forward. And that's for going forward to 2050, but also in the intermediate period where they use 2030 as a, as a baseline as well to consider the pathway going forward. So look at it, it's a substantial piece. Comment, if you could perhaps comment, Noel, on the uh, quite significant um, um, piece within the report around the fabric first principle and uh, if you could just maybe comment on that and its potential for bioenergy um, in the renewable fuel mix, um, considering the, the, that, that piece. Yeah, the, the fabric first principle is where we, I suppose, where, where most people would be aware of it is where, where it comes out in, in the public arena is these retrofit schemes where we're looking at retrofitting buildings, retrofitting, retrofitting domestic houses. And that's the holy grail that they would like to go for it in, in many sense it has been for a number of years however when you start the practical side of that it has proven very difficult there's a lot of buildings first of all as i said we've seven percent uh, listed buildings in the country so they can't be modified to that level there's a that number again which would be very uh, significant in heritage type uh, that can't be modified but then there's a, a, a huge amount of buildings that the cost of modification is just not um bearable so therefore, we are looking at options of how do you decarbonize the heat source. So the fabric first principle is, very, is good for new build, but you still need uh, heat for existing buildings and even for new buildings where you need small volumes of heat, bioenergy fits in quite well there. So it's, it's, a, it's a move from SEI where I suppose giving the overarching, they have to consider all options available. Um, much as their EU counterparts are doing, uh, bioenergy is, is, is expanding rapidly across the continent, um, as it has been for the last number of years. So it, I suppose it's an acknowledgement from SEI that there is a need to consider all technologies in this and that the, the fabric first, although it, it is still uh, very much uh, supported and understandably so, and it, it's, we wouldn't, it is a good thing to be doing, but it's an acknowledgement that it's not going to suit uh, quite a lot of places. Okay, thanks, Noel. Jared, perhaps uh, before I bring you in on the questions, if you could maybe comment on your own um, thoughts on the report, uh, and we hope in the future to be able to uh, maybe do a webinar on it in more detail, but just to give a flavour yeah. to our attendees of yeah, yeah. The initial feedback was quite detailed and a lot of reading, so just maybe if you well, could comment as well. Uh, yeah, no, it's very interesting, and in fact, in February, two significant reports came out from SEI, or the department, and uh, it seemed to nearly con contradict, conflict with each other. We had the deep retrofitting one. Sorry, guys, a bit of background noise. With a deep retrofitting one, uh, which was all about fabric first and getting properties heat heat pump ready, and there was mention there wasn't a single mention of bioenergy on it, right? And it was about deploying six hundred thousand heat pumps in the country, which is all laudable, and I'm all for any renewable energy technology. But two weeks later, then we had the the, the heat plan, and it was a significant study. Sorry, Jerry, just. A Study, heat study. Study, study. Yeah. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. Beg your pardon. Yeah, it's important to be right. Um, where it was, um, you know, it was significant, significant mention of bioenergy, um, a little bit of a rollback on fabric first, and they realized that basically we won't achieve our renewable heat targets if we adapt a fabric first uh, option. That fabric is important, but we need to de deploy, and the word urgent was mentioned several times on the document. We need to urgently deploy renewable heat and bioenergy again, was mentioned several times in the documents. So I thought it was, um, it was, tell it was telling, you know, okay. and, we're all for, and we're all for that. Everybody in this call, of course, is all for that, you know. Yeah, thanks, Ger. And if anyone, if our participants, I, th I would encourage people to read the reports and uh, feel free to feedback any information or feedback that you have to us. Um, so if we move on, uh, maybe just a couple of clarification, just one clarification, Ger, um, just to, on your presentation. Um, in terms of the support scheme for renewable heat, the contract, uh, that SEI would have with the heat user, that would be held by the nursing home or the hotel. Am I correct in stating that, just to clarify, or is that held by Woodco from the... No, the, the, the contract yeah, from the SSRH is held by the whoever owns the boiler, which will be the ESCO, 
or bioenergy okay. installations okay. or SPV. They don't, they have the contract yet. Okay. Um, a question there from Thomas. Um, would could would co qualify for the SSRH for a specific office building within a large energy user complex, assuming the client would not qualify if we consider their full heating load? So it's a quite a specific uh, question, Jared, there from Thomas. So would you have any? Yeah, I, I, I suppose it would. Be, in theory, yes, it can happen. I mean, if if the business has one part of the building or just wants to heat. Um, it would need a survey and listen, you can achieve anything really with the SSRH and get approval. It's all down to metering. So if we can meter and, and isolate the heat that they want to be eligible and the heat that's ineligible or, uh, is separate, um, it can be achieved. So it's, it's all about, that's why the SSRH scheme relies heavily on, on people like ourselves and other companies that are operating in this space to design the system uh, you know, there's a, there's a whole uh, biomass designers um, cr uh, qualification and criteria that you have to they be they have to be the ones submitted submit the application and and so a lot of emphasis is placed on the design of the system. So, but in theory, you know, we have some challenging. Would that, uh, would that be approached similar to a district heating system if you take it as a number of building yeah, yeah, a number of yeah. users in the one complex and if they were to put in a boiler, essentially to feed its own heat needs. But it'd be feeding into the system, and once it's metered into the system, that would probably would that contribute or be able to be eligible to change? I know you can't answer straight out, but it sounds yeah, yeah. It might be. As, as I said, it's all down to metering. Um, you know where, where the heat has been used, and is it eligible, and can it be metered? And if that's the case, if the answer is, is the yes to all three of those, well, then it can qualify for the scheme. Yeah. Okay, um, thanks, Chair, for that. Um, there's another question there from Kin, um, and Kin is asking about the fuel types used in these boilers. Um, is it wood pellet or is it wood chip or is it a mixture of both? So if you could maybe just elaborate more yeah. on the fuel types that are, you're using on in these particular systems. Yeah, yeah. So we've, we've, we've some about to happen on wood chip. Um, and generally, I suppose a rule of thumb for ourselves, uh, given we own the boilers, um, we um, we want to get the cheapest fuel and, and uh, the lowest energy costs and pass some of the savings on to the clients, the majority of it. But um, I guess we, we judge each project on its merits. Generally smaller boilers, 100 to 150 kilowatt, we, we generally go for pellet. If it's up at 500 kilowatt and space permits and um, you know, and they have the infrastructure and all of that, we can put in wood chip. You know? But we're not, it, it's not exclusively pellet or it's not exclusively wood chip. We can, and if, the, if you know, and chip is cheaper. A chip is about one, one to 1.2 cents per kilowatt hour cheaper. So. If we can make chip work and the client is happy for us to do it, we will. Okay, um, thanks very much, Cher, for that. And thanks, Kin, for your question and for joining us this morning. Uh, there's another question there from um, Norman. Um, and it's a question with regard to the removal of the ash and the disposal of the ash, Cher, from the system. So perhaps could you comment on that, please? Yeah, well, if you take the, if you take it uh, literally, um, we do everything, and the, and the property doesn't do anything. But you know, depending on on the and the property, if there's a caretaker on site, and literally the ash is a very simple task uh, to do. It's on the, our ash bins are on a wheel, wheels, and it's just wheeled out, and it's potash. It can be put on flower beds or whatever. Um, so it's um, that's probably one thing. Depending on the site, you know, um, you might get a certain property or certain business that's highly unionized and it's nobody's job to, to remove the ash bin, well then, okay, we'll do it. You know, because look, like, look, fortunately, biomass, as we know, efficient biomass boilers, they produce very little ash. So it could be a question of maybe once a month or once every six weeks, you have to remove this ash bin. So it's not a, a daily or a weekly occurrence, you know? So, um, and generally, given we own the boiler, we're calling into it anyway. So uh, fairly frequently, we service these things a few times a year. And um, so, yeah. But, okay, so, thanks. That's great. Thanks very much for that, Jer. Um, yeah. There's a question in here from Donal. Um, it says, hi, Jer, you mentioned you would supply the biomass. So do you supply the pellet or wood chip at the market rate? So maybe could you, or do you contract with the biomass supplier, I suppose, is the question as well. So maybe just yeah. explain the biomass supply element from the point of view yeah. of that. Yeah, so so quite simply, we, we buy the fuel from, from, from the players that are in the market. We try and get the best price and... Um, we, so the, the heat we charge uh, is the cost of the fuel. 
but we also have a, 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 a premium or, a mar- or other costs bedded into the cost of the heat as well, like the maintenance costs and the warranty cost and, and so on, you know. So all of that is embedded into the, the unit price, the cents per kilowatt hour we charge for the heat. So the cents, we, the cents per kilowatt hour that we charge for the heat is made up of primarily the fuel cost, but there's also a little bit extra for our maintenance costs and recovering a bit of the, the capex costs as well. But it's over a 15-year period. Okay, um, if I do, another question there, Jar, would be um, <clears throat> around the actual maintenance requirements of these boilers, and indeed, generally, uh, whether it's an ESCO boiler or a regular biomass install, can you just elaborate maybe on the importance of the maintenance requirement um, in order to keep the boiler functioning uh, efficiently and, and exactly yeah well well fortunately like SEI have a fairly high bar in terms of the quality of boilers that they're installing on the market and all the boilers installed in Ireland from whoever they're from are of good quality and um, nowadays biomass boilers they have to comply with eco design so they're highly efficient very low emissions um, very clean boilers and but they have to be maintained. So all boiler biomass boilers now are automatic cleaning of the boiler heat exchanger, automatic cleaning of the of the combustion area, and and to have automatic deashing. So you know from a maintenance point of view, they're they're very low maintenance. Having said that, you do need to service the boiler. And typically on the projects I've spoken about this morning, they'd be all fairly high or heavy heat users. So we we would service the boiler maybe two to three times a year. Now, it's in our own interest to do that because it maintains the efficiency. But at the end of the day, you're dealing with wood fuel. There's, there's ash and, you know, fly ash and what have you. So it's, it's, good, it's good practice to um, maintain the boiler. Everyone wins. You get uh, greater efficiency. But they're not, um, they're not something you just put in and walk away and come back to two years later. Um, you do, okay, you do have to. Great. Thanks very yeah. much for that, um, Ger. Um, just uh, if anyone has any other questions, feel free to submit them through the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen. Just um, a follow on question, if I could maybe bring in Jar first, but then maybe Noel on this as well. Um, so you mentioned and you outlined two different types of ESCO contracts, the full ESCO and also the hybrid ESCO. Um, are there other variations of that? And are you open to working with uh, obviously potential clients? on other variations of ESCOs, or is that the only options which are available, um, uh, Ger? Just maybe if yeah, you can comment on that. Yeah. yeah, as I see it, they're probably the only options that are available. Um, the hybrid one is, the full ESCO is one we, we've done. The hybrid one is, is one we've been asked to do on a couple of occasions, and we're doing a couple, where we share some of the benefits, you know, where, where somebody wants to buy the asset, uh, enjoy some of the benefits of the SSRH, and, um, and uh, we, we look after the maintenance and, and supply them for heat. And then some people have asked us, could we enter an ESCO agreement and uh, maybe after 10 years they want to buy it out? Uh, and we can certainly look at that, where they can get the benefits of the full benefits of the remaining five years. So, you know, um, the, so the contracts... there's flexibility in the, the potential contractual yeah. arrangements. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, there's okay. all, we, can do, we, we look at anything, you know. Um, once it makes sense for both of us, it can't be all okay. one side. Okay. Um, Noel, if you perhaps could comment maybe as well, Jar's outline too. Um, I know that this is an area which you have looked at and I think Arby have done work on this in the past from, from an ESCO point of view. Have you any comment on the contractual arrangements or anything? You know, there, there, there's many options out there I mean, and Jar has outlined the, the, definitely the most popular and the most uh, sensible in most cases. We've had some, depending on, on a person's own needs, um, we're, are we aware of, some situations where you might have what's termed an auto producer so you may have a farmer who has forestry themselves and they want to be able to supply some of some of their own fuel and if they can certify that fuel up and ensure it's, it's the correct quality and that's that's very important in terms of the srh they can do so so that there is options there for people that might have uh, either their own fuel source or they might w- be wishing to you know and for example sawmills uh, may, may have a, a, a byproduct that's very suitable for, for uh, the SSRH and very suitable for, for their own heating needs. So, like, there are many options there that people can go for. Uh, some opt to own the boiler themselves, and they may wish to just have a service contract. And you know, it's like anything else, any other, any piece of equipment. You can have a design, build, and operate contract, or you can have just a design and build contract. There are many options available to people in depending on the scale that they're at. So I, I suppose that the flexibility is there depending on what they want to do. But for many, you know, the hotel sector, the leisure center uh, centers, nursing care homes, they like their, their business is not about uh, heat. 
So for them, they just want to have a, a enable heat source. And if, if somebody comes in and, uh, on contract, like Woodco, and they do the entirety of it and they're, they're paying a heating bill at the end at each month, it makes it an awful lot simpler for them. And they can, obviously, they've got the green credentials to go along with it. I mean, it, it, it's very good for their business in that sense. They've got the cost savings and they're doing so without having to, to, to be wondering, is there enough fuel in, in the bunker or do they need to be ch checking that out on a regular basis and the servicing of the boiler, that that's all taken out of their hands. So there's okay, options there for them to, depending on okay. what they want to do. Thanks, Noel. Uh, just a reminder, we have a, quite a diverse audience this, uh, today um, on online uh, through our attendees and participants. So just a reminder, my point from the start, if there are any participants who would like to present at these webinars in the future, we will. We do hope to continue the series right through the year, um, depending on availability or demand and, and interest. Um, but if there are any of our attendees that would our members that would inter be interested in participating and in presenting, feel free to get in touch with us. Jared, there's a, a question in there um, uh, for, about if a business is, if a business closes during the ESCO contract, what are the possible implications? Uh, I assume there are contractual implications, and is there a risk for the client associated with that? So perhaps you could comment on that, Jared. Yeah, I mean, like there's two things: a contract. Yeah, it suit it'll suit it certainly suit a business that sees longevity, right? Um, in in their business, and need, they need to be very solid on it. But like in a doomsday situation, if the if the if the uh, if the business was to fold or close during the contract duration, um, one of the clauses in the contract is that you know they're obliged to, to compensate us for the the opportunity lost to us. Uh, now, if the company's going into liquidation, the funds mightn't be there. So, but um, but there there is a clause in the contract that um that they have to compensate, you know, the opportunity lost to us uh, it, it has to be recovered. So somebody might just decide they want to retire, somebody might want to retire out of a business, leave a perfectly good business and just retire out of it and exit the contract, well then they'd have to pay, pay, pay buy us out of it, you know. Um, because, you know, we're making... We'll be down to a negotiation or discussion based on the yeah, yeah, yeah. agreement. Yeah. But, you know, we're making a fair old investment in it as well, so we're looking at it for... Um, for, um, for a Would you have outlined that there's... Uh, your, you do operate as containerized systems as well, so there's options potentially yeah. to move boilers from a site. And there are, yeah. There's one one condition though. And it's important to say, um, unlike in Britain, um, the SRH in Ireland, uh, the boiler can stay on site. So, so for example, suppose in a business, uh, an owner wants to exit the business and sell the business to an, uh, somebody else, and 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 the, the business remains in the same property. That's fine. You can, you know, that's not a problem. But what we can't do is pick the boiler up from from property A. And move it to property B and still have the SSRH. The SSRH yeah. doesn't travel with the boiler. Okay. Uh, that is the, that is the case in Britain, but not in, not under the rules of the SSRH scheme. So that's so we've got to be fairly solid that the boiler or a business activity is going to remain on that site for for the period. Okay, and um, I think a similar question has come in from Adam. Thanks, Adam, for joining. Is there a problem recovering assets in a liquidation situation? No, well, again, in the contract, we have, we have, um, we have, we, we, we supply a map with it and we have, I suppose, a right away might be too strong a word, but we're in the contract, it says we, we're allowed uninhibited access to our, to our asset, you know, and we just draw it, we mark it on a map where we go, there's the gate, there's the entrance and there's our plant, we've got to be able to get to it. So, um, uh, we own the asset, you know, and, um, okay. We've, we've, um thanks, Chair. If I could bring back in Noel, uh, maybe to comment on the importance of wood fuel quality. Obviously, that's a big, uh, very important point from the point of view of um, optimizing yeah, the performance it, of boilers. So could you maybe just give us an outline of the importance from a quality point of view of, uh, from a wood fuel perspective? Yeah, well, the, the boiler is designed to, to burn a particular quality of fuel. So it maybe in general, it would, you, you, it's the moisture content is, is the biggest factor in change. So, for example, you may have, especially in the smaller boilers, a limit that it must be under 35% moisture content. So that protects those two things. Number one, it protects the boiler, or three things. It ensures that you've got a good efficiency in transfer of the heat, but as well as that, it also protects against uh, erroneous air emissions. If you have too wet a product going into a, a boiler that's not able to burn it correctly, it could have an air emission issue. So for that reason, within within the SSRH rules, it must be a certified fuel. So we would certify that under under the Wood Fuel Quality Assurance Scheme ourselves. Um, but it's a critical component of bioenergy go forward, like any fuel. I mean, there's a standard for diesel, there's a standard for kerosene, there's a standard for gas. Every fuel has a standard. So, um, and, and wood fuels are no different. Okay. 
Thanks, Noel. Two questions in there, Jaron. We'll be coming to the end then. So we'll take those two. The, the last, these are the last two. Are your boilers remotely monitored? Is a question there from Norman. Um, Jer? You're on mute, Jer. Sorry, yeah. Yes, of course. Yeah, nowadays you couldn't dream of selling a biomass boiler unless it's, they're all Wi Fi enabled using the smart technology. So we, we control them remotely, we can monitor them remotely. And actually, an important point is even on the fuel store, uh, we're able to see the level, just like a fuel gauge in your car, the level of fuel in it. So we know when to reorder fuel so that the client, the user, never runs out of fuel, you know. So that's an important point as well. Okay. Um, um, and this, there's a question in there from Rory. Um, and it's particularly regarding schools um, as potential escort clients, considering the seasonal nature of their heat consumption. Um, Rory is wondering how they would meet the minimum heat requirement required by Woodco, which you state as 300,000 kilowatt hours. Yeah, um, yeah, that's the ones we like to do on the full ESCO. But um, listen, uh, we've, we, we understand schools are seasonal. Luckily, the, the schools are seasonal, but it's the winter time. They're usually open you know, from September to, to April or May, when, which is the most heating time. But no, we would look at we would look at, at lower outputs and um, provided the numbers stack up. And you know, as I said, I think an important takeaway from this is every ESCO is flexible. And um, um, and you know we can it can be a hybrid ESCO where where the, the school would own the asset. It's less risk for us then. We just uh, operate it. Uh, or if it's a full ESCO, we'll do it. And if the numbers work for us, it might be a longer payback period. Um, but so be it. You know when you're dealing with a school, it's generally a good solid investment for us. It's fifteen years. And you're talking about large schools with with maybe Typically. significant numbers of pupils and staff, um, rather yeah, than a yeah. small primary school in rural Ireland with. Two teachers yeah no 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 it wouldn't work there students. but you know any school, schools where the schools we're doing or planning on doing this spring um they've heat demands of maybe 150 170 000 kilowatt hours and um that's on a hybrid esco but if it was a full esco we probably would be interested because it's a school i guess you know um you know it's a solid it's a solid uh, investment for us okay um i think that is that takes us to the end and we're right uh, right on time um so uh, just a few thank yous. First of all, thank you to all our participants uh, for logging in this morning and um, for your continued support to our series. Um, we have many regular uh, visitors to our webinars. Um, I'd like to also thank uh, very much, Ger, for taking time out of your busy schedule to present this morning. A very interesting uh, presentation. Um, and I wish you uh, success with, uh, with uh, contracting with more heat users around the yeah, yeah, nice. yeah. Um And I'd like to also acknowledge and thank Noel for his inputs. And uh, finally, I'd just like to acknowledge the work of Teresa O'Brien, our colleague in Erbia, uh, for all her work in getting everything set up behind the scenes. So thanks very much, Teresa, for all your efforts and work in uh, ensuring that um, we have a, a, a successful um, webinar today and indeed uh, right through our series. Um, so with that, we will um, leave it for now. Uh, we look forward to uh, welcoming you all back again for our next webinar on the 16th of March, this day, two weeks uh, at the same time, uh, where we'll be talking about micro anaerobic digestion and the technology options there. So uh, again, we'll leave it at that. Hope you have a good day and stay safe. And thanks very much for joining. See you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye now. Thank you.